<laughs> so, hi guys, this is Danielle with the Motivity Podcast. Uh, today we have Ian on, who's a special guest, um, talking about how they're using AI and actually your cell phone to solve healthcare problems. And he's going to talk a little bit about how, you know, where he grew up, what influenced him to get in technology, and, and how, you know, they're using this or using AI um, to solve healthcare problems and really changing um, the healthcare space. Uh, so, Ian, first of all, hi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having <laughs> You're me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Ian, so, you know, I, do you want to talk about the company first or do you want to talk about, you know, kind of like, you know, where you grew up and how you got into this space, because it is a very unique space and, and uh, you know, you're doing a lot for women uh, right now. Yes. So, so I guess I'll talk about how I fell into the space. And Great. so, um, and so growing up in a environment where there's a lot of uh, gang violence and um, things in, in a lot of poverty, for example, studying that problem that issue how to address gang violence how to address uh poverty we discovered through our research that a lot of it was uh, psychological a lot of it was depression for example anxiety uh fear um suicidal thoughts and and behaviors uh, such as shooting at a person and when they're shooting back back at you you're just standing there right um and so from that particular perspective we looked at technology that we were working with um, in 2015, I was able to work with IBM's Watson and was the first to train Watson to recognize human emotion. And uh, there's a lot of correlations, right? We talked about fear and then that correlates to depression. And so we were able to essentially explore uh, screening a person for a particular um, biological or psychological disposition such as depression. And we were able to eventually do so uh, using uh, cell phone technology, like a cell phone selfie. Um, and so we also looked at things from a workforce perspective. Um, we were training a lot of uh, young people, a lot of people who had been uh, unemployed or long-term unemployed. And we were looking at how really to best um, prepare them to provide for themselves and to stay out. And what we discovered was is that while we were training them on, on soft skills, uh, such as persistence, um, such as uh, self-discipline, that if they didn't have a hard skill to apply those soft skills towards, then it, it, it really wasn't uh, the best opportunity and the best uh, scenario for both parties from a company standpoint and from uh, the, the employee standpoint. And so we started diving into technologies and looking at which technologies were within reach, right? Like, so we really focus on technologies that are about two years out max. And uh, in instead of focusing on technologies, for example, like a quantum computing, which that's probably at least like five or, or, or to 10 years out. And so, so yes, we've been able through my, my background and experience, um, you know, in the community, I was able to take that knowledge um, from the ground, right, from the ground level and, um, you know, essentially rise to the ranks of artificial intelligence globally and then bring that same humility and that same insight with me. That's so interesting. You talked, you know, you talked about hard skills and soft skills. And, and so it sounds like, you know, they, they, they needed the soft skills there, right, to build up and then ultimately lead them to a hard skill. And a hard skill would be learning, you know, this type of technology or any type of technology. Um, you know, how did you identify those people? Like, did you kind of go into the community and, and did you pick them based on, you know, maybe what they were relating to? Like, how did you identify the individuals to start making an impact and, and a change? Uh, sure. Uh, and so I've been involved in mentoring since I was 15. I was the former spokesperson for Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And congratulations, by the yeah, way. Well, well, thank you. And so as a result, since high school, I had been speaking nationally and I had been known for mentoring and working with, uh, with youth. And so um, I also have a, a law degree. When I, when I came out of law school, I was working for the Urban League of Nebraska. And while there, I was working with their youth and education department, et cetera. And so I was able to work with a number of different institutions throughout the community. 
Uh, and then after working one year full time, I skydived and started working for myself. And I've been eating what I kill, so to say, ever since. So this is yeah. so so we're going on 10 years right now. Um, but really, it's been a lot of word of mouth. Like the vast majority of our right. business has been has been word of mouth. And so what you what we try to do is we just try to take care of people. Right. Um, as much as we can and do honest business. And we find that the karma that we put into the world comes back. I think Zig Ziglar said, if you help enough people, you get everything you want. And yeah. so and so we've experienced that. Is that happening for you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we definitely have have experienced that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, everyone has something that they're trying to accomplish. They have their own goals and their own desires. And instead of trying to fit people within a box, uh, you know, we really try to give them what they want. If you had to define your goal right now, what would it be? If you were to say, okay, now I've done, I went to law school, I'm finding individuals, I'm making impact on lives. Then now, what does Ian want now? He's been 10 years with this company, you know, developing, strategizing, working, you know, in many facets of it. So what, where, what do you want now? What is your goal for the next five years? Um, our goal is to become the world's leading boutique um, automation and technology firm. And so for us, you know, we're, you know, we're definitely down that road with a lot of the work that we're doing because yeah. we are niche, right. And we're able to kind of pivot and we're able to jump ahead of a lot of the larger players. Um, but no, we see automation, we see what it's doing, we see how integral it is, but also at the same time, I think there's a lot of opportunities in automation, especially for particular populations that, you know, haven't necessarily, um, you know, been involved in the economy, right, and economic development as as much as you know we would we would like, but automation allows um, and technology allows for uh, economic development at very cheap levels, right? Like it doesn't, it does. yeah, it doesn't take a lot to start a technology company, things of that right. nature, and so it's so yes, yeah, so no, we see a lot of the potential there, and 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 that's one of the reasons. How can we use high technology really to create? Uh, impact and to address societal issues. So Ian, you talk about that impact for just a second. Is the impact and the ideas of automation coming from you guys or is it coming from other individuals that are looking to hire you? So just kind of clarify that. And then what I would love you to do too is just talk about what, how you would define automation and maybe, you know, just so the audience understands because uh, Obviously, I know automation, but I want everyone yes. to understand, yeah, truly what, what kind of problems automation can solve for. So why don't we tackle the first part of that question, which is, uh, is it mostly your firm ideas or can, oh, gotcha. uh, you know, can an outside firm come and, and hire you? So, so we, do, we do both. Uh, primarily, okay. we do a, a lot of internal research and development. Uh, okay. And actually, those promising is and technologies that actually have real world use cases, we commercialize those technologies, right? Um, or what we do is we help train other organizations um, or place individuals within these organizations uh, in order to help bolster the technical capacity of various organizations. Um, as far as, uh, if you could remind me of the second question, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was more, so define automation for people listening. And sure. We have a lot of listeners, that diff, like a lot of scale. And I always feel like we talk very high level. So I try to just break of it course. down a little bit because, and, and it's funny, when I think of automation too, I also think of digital transformation flows into automation. And there's maybe two words. I think the two words are somewhat connected, right? Drive the, the change has to be digital, but the automation is the second part part of it. I don't Absolutely. think anyone could go to automation unless things are digital. And when we say digital, a really easy way to explain digital assets is anything that you've put like into a Google Drive that has a link that's shareable. Those things, that's digital, right? Like I send you a link, you join digital. Um, any digital information, photos are digital. Like that's an easy yes. thing for, yes. Yeah, so um, I'll right? be yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I would, I would say that um, digitization is a subset of automation. I would say yeah. auto, automation is any, essentially any, any human or even animal processes, right, that a machine can replicate, um, yeah. essentially, right? And so we're just looking at automation is all about productivity, 
you know, how can we take human tasks primarily and, and how can we give those tasks to a machine to do so that as humans, we can function or focus on more high level concepts and tasks? Yeah, so let's talk low level for a second. Low level automation and, and examples maybe in life that people are listening, you know, is the fact that there's bill pay, automatic bill pay. The computer reads the bill, hears the amount, and it automatically gets withdrawn, you know, from your account. That's an easy automation, an automatic thing that we all used to do. And we used to write checks, right? Write checks, put it in the envelope, right? That's, that's a simple process. Maybe give another example. And of, of automation just for the listeners to sure. start grasping sure. the concept. Yeah. So so probably the most readily available um I mean there's a couple of, of them. I'll, I'll give you yeah. two. So so one would be a vending machine. Right? A vending machine is a simple, it's a very simple automation, right? Instead of having somebody sitting there behind a kiosk handing you chips and soda, Smart. right? You just have a machine that's that's dispensing that and you don't have to pay a person to do that task, a person can be hired for another position where they have they might have to use more of their skill sets uh, as a and result. Keep, yeah, and keep in mind, it could also tell you the weight, so it could tell you missing, um, you know, soda, you know, soda cans or whatever exactly. it is. Right? It, it's actually take could take it a step further that it can measure the weight. So even in, you know, in a hotel, right? In the you have the refrigerators, they're coming to your room. They already know that you're you drank the water. Yes, right? they're coming to say, "Hey, let me just refill it." Or, you know, technically, it could have been on a robot; he could deliver it too. But that's, you know, that's going a little exactly. bit further. <laughs> and, and, and then the other ones really have to do with um, there's a lot of automation around the checkout experience, right? And so, yeah. you know, you used to have a bunch of uh, 16 year olds that would be manning kiosks, um, totally. you know, helping people go through uh, as cashiers. But today, if you go to a Walmart, right, you might see, you know, 20 different checkouts, but then maybe one of them is open, right? Like with the actual person. And then you have yeah. everyone else going through the self checkout, right? And so essentially they automated much of that process. Um, and then some of it they threw back on to the consumer, right? Um, yeah. To bag their own things, et cetera. And so, yeah, there's a lot of that that's coming that's down the great, pipe. Those are great examples, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Example, so, by the way. Yep, yeah, no, thank you. Um, so no, there's a, there's a lot of automation coming down the pipeline that affects people in huge ways and you know it's you know we, we feel like it's our responsibility to really help bridge the gap as a as a technology firm between where the world is today and where it's going and, and how can we help humanity how can we help society to bridge that gap in a in a smooth as possible transition uh you know without there being you know chaos uh when machines are pretty much doing a lot more of uh, societal tasks. And so, um, you know, I, I love the, I love the example of, of the, the, the kiosk and checking out. The only thing I get upset about is how annoying the sounds are sometimes. Yes. And the reminder is I'm like, I got it. I got it. But I, it, it's a great example. And so, 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 you know, if someone is listening and they want to get into automation or they want you to come look at your business, um, it's Infinite Eight, right? That's the company, am I right? Yeah, it's uh, Infinite Eight Industries in particular. Industries, so, yep. okay. Because and and that you'll come in and you'll assess the business on how to automate that business. I guess you know retail has been highly affected. Healthcare has been affected by this. Um, manufacturing is another great one. Manufacturing actually was in more of the automation business, I think, than we ever realized. But now they're trying to automate the people and the process and the things that they're doing a little bit further. So tell us what are the big things you're tackling now? We talked, you know, about the cell phone and using the cell phone to automate healthcare. How is how are those pieces connected now? Absolutely. And, and give us, you know, give us this project that you're working on that I think is amazing. So so essentially by working with Watson, I was inspired to compete against Watson. Right. And so Well that, that's what, simple. Yeah. Talk and about so, a disruptor. <laughs> yes. And, and so from from that perspective, uh, you know, we essentially decided to uh, to take on Watson. Right. And create our own artificial intelligence. Um, and we felt like that the healthcare industry was the safest, most ethical route to develop um, complex artificial intelligence. And so okay. with our AI physician. 
like we talked about depression, right, being one of the, our first forays into the healthcare industry, um, we decided to um, we decided to start screening on other things. For example, like we started screening on COVID nineteen uh, using a selfie. We did clinical trials, uh, and we were able to show that that the AI can be as accurate as a PCR test, right? Um, which is the gold standard for for testing for COVID and a number of other diseases. And then that confidence also allowed us to take on um, more complex diseases such as breast cancer, right? And so uh, currently we also are able to provide clinical decision support by screening individuals online that can go to a web-based application, just uh, take a selfie of themselves, upload the image. And then within seconds, they're able to get a report uh, that has charting, and then also uh, has other information about causes or risks associated with uh, breast cancer and, um, you know, different aspects of, of that disease. So to go, walk us through just the COVID example, and obviously I under, you understand it, but not everyone does. What you're doing is taking data and points based on that screening time and then, you know, comparing it to other individuals that whether they have COVID or don't. So you're not actually swabbing correct? Or you, you're yes. just kind of at more asking questions about your symptoms and, those, uh, and that data, you know, tell us, a little. I'm just assuming this is- No, 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 no. So, so we're talking about clinical protocols, right? Yeah. And, and so, so no, essentially during the, um, for example, during the COVID-19 clinical trials, there would be a person that would come in and essentially um, I created a cloud-based electronic record system that was closed, right? Just it was closed off uh, to the public. And essentially, I come in, enter in that person's information, ask them, you know, about their background and, and, and medical history, et cetera. And then I would, I would screen them with um, our AI was running on an embedded, um, basically a, com uh, a computer module. And then we had a camera connected to it. And so I would screen them in person. And then mm -hmm. I also would take a cell phone and then I would take an image and then I would go back into the lab and then I would screen the image as well. And so we were able to compare uh, screening with a camera in person, like a web camera okay. versus mm -hmm. screening with a cell phone camera. And we found that they both were um, just as accurate. It didn't matter that it was a cell phone image versus you know, okay. a, um, you know, a, a web camera. And so the process for that pretty much is it's making a determination 100% based off the image, right? And so it wasn't, we're not taking any information that they give us as far as data and integrating that, right? Like uh, uh, questions that they may answer, et cetera, because that's not as accurate as a, if you actually take an image of a person. Um, a lot of our research comes from, it's a book that came out in the seventies called How to Read a Person Like a Book, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so we you take- You should we, write a book that says how to read a person <laughs> by a picture. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, we might have to, I might have to uh, break you off a piece of that. But- Yeah, but I no. mean, forget the, forget the book now. It's just, yeah, that's, I yes. think that's a great idea for you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And so um, our research in emotion, you know, led us to the conclusion that, for example, emotion never turns off. It's like a faucet that's always running. And so if, if a person, like for example, for depression, if a person says they're filling out a form like the PQ2 or the PQ9 is the standard form for depression, or, or depression a person can say whatever they want, right? They can put down whatever they, they answer, want. Right. They can say yes, no, maybe. Yes. They don't, I mean, no one even reads these things anymore. Exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. But even, but even if a person is trying to, um, through an image, if they're trying to hide their emotion or how they feel, right? It's, it's obvious. It's very, very obvious. And so a lot of times a person looking at other people, they can tell the same information that the AI can, can discern, but the AI just brings some type of um, objectivity to it, right? Uh, and, and that's pretty much, that's all it is. It's just bringing some type of objectivity to it, but you know, it's, it's doing the same things that humans are able to do uh, as well, just looking at a person when they walk in the room and feeling that person's energy. Ian, and, and give us, a, so 
in the COVID example, what were you screening for in that image? What was the, what was the ultimate result that you were trying to identify? And then let's pivot to the, the breast cancer and what, sure. what, what you're doing there. Sure. So with COVID-19, there were 14 CDC recognized symptoms, right? Um, so for example, you, yeah, you might have a uh, shortness of breath, for example. I get um, it. I get yep, it. This is, exactly. Wow. I didn't even think of those pieces. So yeah. I was just thinking of like, it's funny, I wasn't thinking of the symptoms. I was thinking of like a positive test, not a negative test, which is, okay, that's why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we also, I mean, yeah, I mean, we integrated um, those results as well. Individuals that, that had um, self-verified or um, formally verified um, test results as well. Amazing. But it's, but yes, I mean, we... In, in our area, we make very deep algorithms. And I think that what the industry is missing is they don't realize, or maybe some do, right? But overall, I think a lot of people and a lot of data scientists are missing the fact that AI is a lot smarter than we think it is, right? It's a lot smarter. It can learn a lot more complex um, uh, ideas, right? And, and internalize that. And so for us, we specialize in making very deep algorithms um, with, with a narrow scope. Ian, who's writing the algorithms? Are you guys coming up with algorithms? Like, so if I came to you with, you know, a use case, would you develop the algorithm based on the use case? Yeah. So, so all of our algorithms are original, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. And so everything that we do, um, you know, we, we pretty much do internally. Right. And so Amazing. if an organization, yeah, yeah if, if they came to us with the rid with something that they wanted us to screen for, et cetera, we would come up with the algorithm and create it. It's amazing. So it's, it's amazing. So tell us about breast cancer and it's breast cancer awareness month. Right. And it is, um, it is, you know, women around the world, you know, um, struggle with the fact that we have to go get mammograms and it, it, you know, talking as a woman, it's not easy. It's not fun. It hurts. It's like actually completely uncomfortable. Any anybody's listening who makes this, those uh, X-ray machines, they're awful. <laughs> but Absolutely. I appreciate the woman there helping you. You know, like it, it's it's an experience, and you have to go every year. It's very important, and obviously, you know, I don't know the statistics on on how how many diagnoses there are of breast cancer, but I think anything we could do from a preventative standpoint and get ahead of it, um, like you're doing. Um, you know, could move a mountain, right? And it could save lives at the end of the day. Um, so talk to us just about what you're doing there and how AI and automation is helping us diagnose the possibility that you would be susceptible to breast cancer or what are you catching or, you know, what is it doing? So absolutely, wanna, yeah. So no, I was, so I guess I'll talk first about my inspiration. Um, yeah. I was, I was inspired to go after breast cancer by my mother and by my aunt. Um, my aunt, Anne, which the algorithm is named after, is called the Anne algorithm. And my aunt, she passed late last year from, from breast cancer. And so she had been fighting for a long time. And so I wanted to do nope. something yeah. for her. Now, did you, but, she catch it early or was it? No, it was too late. It was too late. Yeah, it was too late. And that um, was, now, do you think part of, and so we're, we're pivoting just for a quick yep. second, and I love the inspiration talk. But I think what we said is like, you have to get checked every year and some women don't. And I think you're going to go into that because the cost is expensive. Like I have insurance, which is great and I'm lucky, but not everyone is in my case, like going back to that poverty. So take us, don't forget to take us there. Yeah, ab <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm and so, the, the yeah, no, and, and, and so no, I mean, we come, you know, like I said, the community that my aunt comes from, I mean, she doesn't come from a lot of money um, and you have a number of, of women that, that they don't want to go to the doctor if they don't have to. Right? And, and that shouldn't even be an issue. Like that shouldn't even be a problem. And that's what's, I guess, so frustrating. Like, yes. you know, and, I don't know. You know, healthcare is expensive, but that's, I guess, people live in London and these other countries where healthcare is free. But who knows <laughs> if everyone who, you know, who knows if everyone really goes to the doctor? You know, I guess that would be maybe some statistics that you could look at. Does all those women get mammograms if healthcare is free? So actually, thirty percent of women have never had one. They've never had a mammogram uh, in they, the United States. Looked, so outside of the U.S., so I would love to know what the statistics are out of the U.K. where where 
where healthcare is free, right? So you don't pay oh, for yeah, healthcare. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh no, definitely. I would love Europe, to know. Yeah, Europe. Europe is is they're light years ahead of the United States in in healthcare. I completely understand why people conduct medical tourism, right, and go to Europe to have procedures so, done. So there's a lot of data on how far behind we are. And listening, because obviously I work in the healthcare industry and technology. We are very far behind the U.S. compared to every other, ever the country. We are way, we are light years behind, guys. So, you know, and I and I really think that it's a. Um, I think the issue is diversity. What do, What do you think the issue is? I, I think, to be honest, I think it's diversity. I mean, in what do you mean um, by that? Go into because, a little bit more detail. So, yeah. for example, like um, like Finland has one of the the best healthcare systems in the world, right? And they don't have a lot of diversity. Right. So there's not a lot of societal infighting about where resources should go. Right. Yes. Yes. There's not. That is right. We are not a communal country of data, too. Like we don't yes. share data across hospitals. And we, yes, you're right. Yep. It's and, getting and better. So, we're, we're pushing. Yes. We're trying. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's that's the conversation. So. Yeah. So, yes, I think that's it. But also from the inspirational side, my mother, um, she had an unfortunate incident where during a routine um, exam, a mammogram, she was actually uh, sexually assaulted by the physician that she had entrusted herself with, right? And so essentially by allowing for an or for a woman or, or a man to, to be screened at home, to self-screen themselves, it completely takes out, right, the, the, the need to potentially put yourself in that position. It also helps a physician from, from potential liability uh, as, as a result. And so, so yes, it's, it's cheaper. We're trying to, of course, address the price because your average mammogram is anywhere between $150, $350. Um, the machines, for example, are anywhere between um, thirty, well, $50,000 uh, for a mammogram machine. If you're doing a CT or an MRI, they can go up to $2 million. Uh, and then also you have a lot of women and men that are located in rural parts of America, right? Where, where there may be one doctor, right? That, that they have for the whole County. Um, and, and then one more thing I'll add is right now for in the United States, for every 3.3 physicians, uh, there's a caseload that they have of seven, 7,811 uh, patients. Right. So you're, you're talking about over 3000 patients, um, you know, roughly per physician. I mean, that's, you know, way too much. Load. I was working at the Urban League, I had a caseload of 125 students and that was a lot. So I could imagine having thousands of students that, you know, that I have to provide for. And so yeah. we're just and you yeah, cut we're just corners with, like you, you, you do. You end up cutting like to me. I mean, I don't go to a primary. I honestly I go to my gynecologist because I it's just too much. Like it's too much to manage, too. I mean, from me, from where I sit, too. But from the doctor's point of view, I do think there needs to be some of the consolidation. Now, if they share data, that would be a different story. But no one is sharing all this data. So you're like going to silos of doctors and you're like, this is just. I don't know. It doesn't make any, to that point, it doesn't make any Absolutely. sense to me, but going back to the kind of the, the poverty piece, you know, you're, you're trying to build this new era of screening, right? Like you're trying to get to that entry point because you've seen women who, you know, whether they go pay for the mammogram or they had a bad experience or they didn't catch it in time, that is a, you know, it's not a requirement to have a mammogram, but it should be a requirement, of, you know, because it is such a threat. It's such a big threat. To get cancer, it's there. So, what do you do? You know, what? Do you, how are you trying to, to fix that? Yeah. Well, well, also, well, through automating certain aspects of the pipeline, right? Um, we're not trying to necessarily replace the entire pipeline. We're more so really trying to um, to add triage, so to say, um, actually filtering, you know, um, where that patient needs to go in the healthcare system. We're really trying to triage at the very edge and the, the most edge of devices that all of us have, right, is, is like a cell phone. And so if we can just utilize a cell phone technology, we don't require any type of special machinery, et cetera. We make it as simple as possible to really try to provide healthcare anywhere. And that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide a minimal 
um, base level of healthcare anywhere um, that an individual at least can can receive some type of internet or cell phone signal. Um, and so, and so you, yes. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I'm listening. I was curious if you've had the opportunity to to present this to hospitals. Have Have you had that partnership meeting to say, hey, we want to offer this service, and and they would, you know it would be an offering and you can do this step prior to meeting with a physician. Like has, has those, yes. have those conversations taken place yet for you? Yes. Yeah, so um, for example, we've had a conversation. Uh, actually we've had ongoing negotiations probably for like the last nine months with, uh, oh, no. uh, yeah, with like an Ivy league um, hospital that I won't, I won't name, but oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah. But this, this hospital, they, for example, um, an oncologist came to me and said, hey, we're very interested in your pain algorithm, yeah. right? And we want to essentially determine post-operation a person's pain level so that we can make sure that we're giving them the right dose of opioids in order to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not liable for overdoses a as a result, right? Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Look at my face. I mean, I'm like, all right, fair so, enough. So what we're doing with this AI is instead of having a million different applications or, or like web apps, right? Yeah. We took all of those algorithms and we've consolidated them into one AI, right? So with one shot, one screen, you can be screened for a multitude of, of healthcare dispositions, uh, as opposed to having to go to this machine and then that machine and then that machine, uh, just one shot, right? It can analyze you for a number of different uh, illnesses or um, you know health decisions. So, Ian, can you just tell me when I'm getting sick? <laughs> At what time of yes. day? What what I should be taking? What medicine? Can you just keep me alive till I'm like 120? <laughs> Absolutely. When you figure out. <laughs> How to take 20 years off my life. Could you tell me what how to do that too? Because and, I, and, and we're all dying to stay young too. So I mean it's 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 funny that you say that because I did do an analysis, for example, of I believe it it was Finland. And Finland has a very small population. And yeah. one thing, for example, that we've done is we've we've taken our AI and we've integrated it with smart bathroom mirrors. Right. And so Technically, we what we did was we put our cam put a camera on top of a, a smart um, bathroom mirror, where it, it doubles as a TV, and so you can go in the bathroom every day and you can have yourself analyzed in real time. So, so you when you're talking about you know catching diseases at the earliest possible level, you're talking about longevity of life. You know, it's 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 my theory that or that individuals that would be able to screen themselves daily, that that population yes. overall would be a healthier population. And they would yeah, live longer. Yeah, because it could be like, hey, go buy this serum or go buy this, or you need a little bit of this. Exactly. I mean, yeah, if, if somebody could tell me what to put on my face every morning to, I mean, I'm, I'm be, you know, I, no, I, it's, I mean, you laugh, but like the beauty industry is so large, right? And there's so many products if you're analyzing what my face looks like every day, then you could say, hey, you should take, th or take this vitamin. You need this. I'm seeing you low in this just based on your complexion. Pretty. Absolutely. So Pretty no, remarkable, a, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot that can be done. I think the, um, what we're doing is really introducing this proof of concept to the healthcare industry at it large. Yeah. Because you, because you have, um, for example, most imaging is based off of, uh, in vitro, right, where they take some type of uh, sample and or, like I said, they're using um, radiation, essentially. And so using ex vivo imaging where we're just completely taking imaging from outside the body and we're not using any radiation, that's something that we were the first to propose to the FDA, right? Um, and so they're, they're really right now, there isn't really a true pathway, right, for uh, this type of technology, you have a lot of regulators that are are behind the ball, but they're they're trying to catch up uh, to the industry. And so, you know, really, we're just more so campaigning about the technology and the different opportunities and the changes that it will bring to healthcare in the future. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing. I I, I mean, you know, I'm blown away about by all that you're trying to accomplish, right? And 
pieces behind it. I think there's a million. I think you're going to be really busy, obviously, after the show and <laughs> to listen to this and every healthcare industry. I know the hospitals I work with. I think they would love to have you know something like this as a pre-screening or, or pre-justification or just data points prior. Sometimes you go into the doctor and you're just again you're going back to that form. You're filling out a form. They know nothing about you, but exactly. instead. You can give them a clear image. Hey, this is what I look like. This is what's happening. And this is how I feel. Um, it, it, it's pretty powerful. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, you know, our, our, our goal is just to give physicians and patients to empower them with more data they've ever had before, not just only with an image, but also to provide them with a full health report, right? That, that can also provide some type of uh, decision-making support for physicians so when they go in, they're not doing unnecessary screenings for patients, right? They're really utilizing their resources and optimizing those resources. Right. Forget my knees. Tell me when I'm going to get cancer. Tell me what I need to do to prevent <laughs> it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Ian, tell us a little bit, like, say someone wants to get this information and they want to run as a patient, they want to run this analysis on them. Um, so how do they find you? Where do they go? What do they do? Because I want to sign up as soon as we're done talking. Sure. Sure. So essentially you go to our website, uh, www.infiniteaindustries.com uh, yep. forward, forward slash AI doctor, right? AI doctor. Um, okay. We'll yep. put that and, in and the it, notes section if yep. anyone's listening. So sure. Anywhere sure. you're and listening you, to a podcast, there'll be a yep. link to his website. Sure. And, and even if you go to infiniteaindustries.com, you'll see AI doctor at the top. So you, you can't really miss it. Okay. Um, but once, but once you go on there, you can essentially, it's like a very quick, process right um okay. and it essentially walks you through the process of uploading your image and uh payment like for example you can pay in uh with a debit or credit card or you can also pay with cryptocurrencies as well oh. um or your fsa that, card because that's a visa so just keep that yes. in mind if you <laughs> Absol- have insurance i don't know i use my Absol- fsa card for everything so Ab- absolutely and so it's, it's uh yeah. it's also interesting because if you use crypto for example then then you have that patient interaction on the blockchain, on a public blockchain, right? Yeah. And and so that's really where we're also pushing. Data. Yeah. You can't break it. It's your own link. It's your own exactly. information. That's, you know, that's obviously a big part of this conversation. We need to have part two just on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I actually, yeah, I have a friend that's doing a lot of the blockchain. So maybe we'll get him on and the three of us can talk. It'd be a fun session to chat through. But, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'm also the uh, lead drafter of the drafting committee um, for the Healthcare Standards Institute, and okay. essentially we're we're working on creating um, standards for physician credentialing, right? Uh, in the, with blockchain, and so we are in the healthcare space, um, and you know we're like creating standards in that area. And so our organization really was just a trailblazer and was kind of, you know, cutting our way through the forest and the jungle, so to say, uh, you know, in, in order to be able to provide great recommendations for organizations that are following behind us. And, and I think into that point and just going on like screening, like every organization has a different screening platform and, and being a mom, right. I'm like responsible for kids and then me. And then it just feels like every time I'm just filling out new forms, like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the same form, you know, why is the data not replicable? Why is it not the sta- standard format? And then I can say, oh no, he went, you know, my son went here and here and this is the sections I needed to add. I, I don't get, I don't get why that is. And hopefully you're changing it and helping the world with that because it takes a lot of time. Like even if I have a nanny, right? I send her to the doctor with my kid. He, I have to fill out the form, but I can't add in, oh, he went to the allergist or he went, you know, he's changed his diagnosis on this, or he's taken this medicine, or he's seeing that. Where is all that data? I'm sorry, that data Absol- is so important. Abs- so- Absol- absolutely. I mean, and, and I think the wonders about blockchain technology is that essentially it's creating a, u- u- a universal database. Correct. Right? Correct. That, that, ev- that everyone can access freely at any point in time. Um, and, and I think that's what's phenomenal because you're saving time, not have, not having to replicate processes or replicate information, uh, it's all in one place. And so I think that cryptocurrencies and, and things of that nature, they get the headlines, 
but really the the most simplistic aspects of just having um, a, a public ledger, right? I think is 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 really what's going to drive use cases for the technology going into the future. Definitely, and, and and he's right. You know, having having your own chain or your own information that can't be broken is so powerful, right? Now that is your data. I think your hard part, Ian. This is just is that we have all these people wanting change, but we still have doctors that are hard. Using technology is not always the easiest, and it's that learning curve is quite big, and we know that. So we can talk more about that because that's Absolutely. what I kind of deal with in my world. You know, I. Cisco has a lot they're doing. We're trying to extend video endpoints to schools. So if they have to do a screening, they could go to a school on a video endpoint. So keep that in mind. Yes. So maybe I can connect some of those bigger, you know, dots for you as well. I know they're trying to extend the internet everywhere. So there's no problems on connecting. I think that's another piece. We really need the world to step up here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But no, I mean, with the, with the work that you're doing and, and the work that you guys are doing at Cisco, you know, clearly you guys are, are helping to address some of those problems. Well, we're trying to connect all the rural areas to your point, right? You're in a rural area and you want great health care and great outcomes, but we still need to connect. We need the connectivity to get there. Um, so, you know, any last words, Ian? I know we're, we're coming up on time and, and I love this conversation. I could talk more about it if you want to come back on the show. So. Uh, yes, sure. No, I mean, first and foremost, I just want to, um, you know, thank my my mother and my aunt for the inspiration, particularly Definitely. since it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I'd like to shout out all the breast cancer survivors, right, that, yeah. that are out there as well. And then also at the same time, um, you know, we know with healthcare that in the house and every household, primarily the the woman is the champion she's the one that makes sure that everyone else takes you their medicine Ian. that they that they <laughs> that they go to the doctor on time etc and so so no that's essentially who our champions are in in the community we know that working with women is extremely important in order to ensure you know, the the health and prosperity of of the family and i think you said it you know a thousand percent right all the breast cancer survivors um, and anyone we lost you know May they rest in peace and we love them. Your inspiration is is remarkable. You're trying to help and save lives. I don't think that there's anyone that could ever say, you know, don't do it more. We want you to do more of it. I want to see more of it. Um, Absolutely. You know, it's really making an, an impact even down to me and maybe, you know, if I want a daughter down to her. So, um, you know, you're remarkable. Thank you for being on the show today. Um, you know, and um this is the Motivity Podcast with Danielle. We are simplifying the tech chat. Hopefully you guys got a little bit of insight and maybe you want to go into automation and maybe you want to learn a little bit about AI. Because um, as Ian's saying, you know, it, it's a great industry. It's changing the game. It's making our lives easier, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I giggle because, uh, you know, we always know everyone's a little scared of technology, but don't be because I think what you're seeing is that it, there's so many use cases. And so many problems we do want to solve with technology. We're trying to make it easier so we could focus on the fun conversations, not the other ones. So, uh, again, Ian, thank you for being on the Motivity Podcast. This is your host, Danielle. And uh, I hope you guys have a great day and get those mammograms. And, uh, you know, we want to solve every breast cancer uh, case out there. So I'm glad right. we're bringing awareness to this conversation. Mm -hmm.